Constructed from a crucible of expulsion, exploration and intellectual innovation, the Hereford Mapamundi is a prime example of the many wonders of the medieval world. Centred on Jerusalem and overlooked by an omnipresent Christ, it provides a glimpse into a particular 13th century worldview conveyed through the manipulation of proximity and iconography. The map itself falls into the genre of Mapamundi, translated as Cloth of the World, and as the largest surviving world map, the Hereford map occupies a unique position in medieval cartography. So what's included in the map? Well, the map follows a TO structure where the three great bodies of water, the Nile, Don and Mediterranean Sea, divide the world and form an off-centre T within the wider O of the inhabited world. Asia occupies the biggest section of the map and is populated with biblical stories and some amazing creatures. Europe is found in the bottom left and made clearly visible by high levels of urbanisation. Africa is in the bottom right hand corner and significantly includes these marvellous peoples found on the edge of the inhabited world. What makes the map so exciting is that it engages with so many different forms of authority, biblical, classical, secular and even debatably climatic. This in turn enables historians to approach the map from a variety of angles, including the study of race in the 13th century. Medieval racial studies is very much an emotive topic that continues to spark debate in the modern day concerning the terms we use and what constitutes a racial category. Where does the balance lie between more embodied forms of race, such as religion, and epidermal race, such as skin colour? Indeed, the Hereford map was constructed in a period of Jewish expulsion and the rebirth of climatic theories, both events that differentiated between peoples. Therefore, these two short videos will engage with these debates and with the help of leading academics, explore the portrayal of race on the Hereford Mapamundi. The map presents itself as the God's eye view of creation and in that uh, framework, there, there's an, an ontology of differentiation. You know, there are uh, peoples here and there, and there are differences, and this um, it's part of the uh, the marvel of uh, creation, and also. Uh, I, would, I, I, I strongly think that in, in, in these Mappa and Mundi, um, this genre, that center and periphery co-construct each other, that there, there's really an, not an opposition between center and periphery, but a, a, an, inter, an interchange or a co-construction. You need, it, the center requires the periphery requires the center, right? So in, in the center of the Hereford map, the type of uh, crucifix um, is a, a, a domesticated image that would be everywhere in you know, church art in England at that time. So it's like seeing yourself or your own place at the center. If the crucifix was at the centre, then what can be found at the margins of the map? Well, on the edge of the map, you can find what we now call the British Isles, paradise, and some rather intriguing peoples with heads of dogs and eyes in their chest. Where the word monstrous comes from is perhaps quite interesting in a medieval context. And I'm sure you've encountered this in your reading, that um, it's derived from latin from latin terminology meaning uh, well, well the, 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 there's the latin verb monstrare which means to show or to demonstrate and there's the latin verb monere which means to warn and the word monster for medieval people 
has both of those terms behind it in the way that they understand medieval monsters. Monsters have been put there. They've been put on the earth for a reason. So they've been put there by God. On the one hand, as a warning, but also to teach, to teach us things, to show us things, to demonstrate things to us about ourselves. Now, that's a very particular way of looking at the world, isn't it? It's, it's a very Latin Christian centered view of the world. Think about our world maps again and think about the world map in its simplest form. So think about the TO map where we've got the disk of the world divided into three by uh, the rivers Nile and Don, and then as the cross, uh, as, as the downstroke of the T, the Mediterranean. We've got Asia at the top. We've got Europe in the bottom left-hand corner. Africa in the bottom right-hand corner. Educated medieval people, as you all know, regarded that threefold division of the world as also a threefold ethnic division, corresponding to the descent of the three sons of Noah. So Yarpeth. Um, who uh, is the, the founder figure of Europe and Europeans, um, Sam, uh, another of Noah's son, who becomes the founder of the, the Asiatic people, so it's the root of the word Semitic, um, and Ham, uh, who uh, settles Africa and is the descendant of the African peoples, so in some simplified version for, versions of medieval thought, the originator of Islam, so the ultimate originator of Islam, uh, and in some versions also the originator of dark-skinned peoples who live in Africa. And of course medieval people didn't think all three continents were the same in their valuations when they thought about them ethnographically. Um, there was a medieval view, for example, that the sons of Yarpath, who'd settled Europe, were the originators not only of the European peoples but also of the nobility. So as you'll be aware, um, just as there are three sons of Noah and the three uh, racial uh, partitions of the earth, um, so there are also the three orders of society. There are the nobles, uh, the, the clergy and the peasantry, and on one medieval view uh, the nobles are descended specifically from uh, Noah's son Yarpath, and they also inhabit uh, Europe. And as a corollary of that, the unfree peoples of the world, so the, the correlate to the peasantry as a social estate, inhabit Africa and are uh, the descendants of uh, Noah's son Sham, who incurred the curse of his father um, after, after seeing Noah naked and mocking him. So when medieval Europeans looked at the world of their day, looked at it biblically, but also ethnographically, they didn't see a world of equal people. They're thinking very much in terms of a story of us and them, in which we collectively have been singled out for salvation and others have been singled out by ethnicity and descent, as well as by religion for damnation and destruction. Now, it's not entirely straightforward with the monstrous peoples. Um, as we know, there are artistic depictions from the Middle Ages that show the apostles being sent out to evangelize the monstrous peoples, to preach the word of God to them, which suggests that um, in medieval views, they weren't automatically um, damned to hell, otherwise what would be the point of preaching the word of God to them? They, they must be capable of salvation. But nevertheless, um, underpinning this idea, there are, I think, quite deep-rooted medieval ways of thinking um, that see the entire inhabited world as a kind of revelation of God's purpose in which we we Latin Christians stand at the center. It really is ultimately all about us. And the whole idea of a monster, this instrumentalization of particular kinds of people, the idea that they've been put there by God, basically to help us, to teach us things and to serve as a warning to us, is an interesting and actually a rather troubling way of thinking about other peoples, don't you think?
the idea of difference and the other's kind of endemic throughout human culture, isn't it? And the tendency we all have to distort and misrepresent people who are different from ourselves. And that would have been, I think, no difference. No, that would have been no different in the medieval period to how it is, unfortunately, still today. Um, there's also the, the idea that everything on the map is, is a, the map is shown, it's definitely in a Christian context, and you've got the Last Judgment at the top with Christ looking down on his creation. And essentially, I think everything in the world is part of God's creation, and that includes all the strange things. All, all the otherness and weirdness as well as ourselves. Um, so it, there is a kind of inclusivity, although there's definitely difference and, a, and an interest in, in, in difference, I think. Um, I think there's one, I mean, it's hard to say that there's any kind of negative negativity about the difference, um, apart from in one case, of course, which is the image of the Jews worshipping the idol which is identified as um, Mahoon or Mahout, um, a comma, just a term really, a general term used for any sort of idol really. And they are identified as Jews and the, the first figure is shown with a, you know, the common caricature of a large nose. And this particular idol is defecating on the altar. So it's quite a nasty image really. But that, that does fit very well into its historical time frame. I think with the expulsion of the Jews by Edward I having happened within the decade earlier, probably the map being made. Um, so it's very much, that very much sets it in its time, I think. So how does the Hereford map interact with Judaism? And what sort of conclusions can be made about clerical elite attitudes towards Jews? The main um rhetorical device that maps have is proximity right location in relation to other things and so when we look at maps like it matters that you always like have the whole image and know where you're going in relation within that um so this is the whole image uh and we're going to zoom in over here uh as i was saying before right asia above europe down here africa over here though africa bends upward with the nile that goes up that way so it's kind of crooked excuse me, Crooked T.O. map. Um, and we have Terra Egypta here, the land of Egypt, with the wonderful <coughs> <coughs> twisting line of the um, wandering of the Israelites for 40 years uh, between the arms of the Red Sea. Um, and if we zoom in and in, there we go. So um, you see... Uh, a group of figures labeled Yudei uh, kneeling in front of an altar which has a cloth on it, um, on which is a sort of calf, um, but labeled Mahu, M A H U with a suspension mark over the U. So perhaps Mahun, uh, although perhaps also Muhammad, um, but in either case, the reference is the same. Mahun is. Um, a, you know, an imagined, but a purported idol worshipped by Muslims. Um, one of the common ways that ideology functions is by taking um, internal properties of anxiety and externalizing them onto other groups, often groups that highlight that anxiety. Um, well, this is an ancient scene, right? This is the worship of the golden calf. That occurs at a moment when there aren't actually Jews. There are Hebrews, there are Israelites, but as you can see, Moses is up here. He's only just now getting the Ten Commandments. There is no Jewish law yet. Without Jewish law, there's no Jews, right? There are the there is the what racial or ethnic linguistic group that will become the first Jews. There aren't Jews yet. So they're not violating Jewish law in essence, right? Because they haven't yet received those laws, which Moses is now getting. Um, and so I think it matters a lot that they're labeled Yudei. Yudei was the medieval term for the medieval group. And they're dressed as medieval people. Uh, they have medieval hairstyles, they're wearing medieval robes, look vaguely kind of monastic actually, with kind of cowls around their necks. Um, and so, 
the image that's depicted, which also then by having a Muslim idol in theory, this Mahoon, right? Islam doesn't exist at the period, at the moment when this scene is set either, right? So you have a modern group with their modern name in their modern clothes, worshiping an idol that was to them a modern phenomenon, conflating Jews and Muslims and polytheist idol worshipers altogether, right? Um, and so again, this like notion of externalizing, you know, Christians are this hung in a church, right? If you were to look at this scene and then turn and look toward the altar, you would have seen a scene that looked a whole lot like this, right? Um, but here, obviously, it's all terrible. Um, and that is um, exaggerated, maybe yet worse, by the fact that that idol is raising its hind leg and defecating on this altar. It's possible that this golden idol, it's the golden calf, is defecating gold coins. Um, and that would tie into um, standard anti-Semitic tropes about Jews being obsessed with money. And if you look at the, um, the Jew at the front of this image, who is represented in the standard uh, racial caricature with a very large hooked nose and a, and a beard shown in full profile to highlight the nose and the beard. Um, his gaze is actually locked, not on the idol, but on the excrement that comes out of it. The Exodus iconography does so much more than merely reflect the biblical authority. It highlights medieval thought to alleged Jewish faults, such as greed and false worship. And thus the scene can be read as both part of the biblical narrative and also, as argued by Deborah Strickland, as an attempt to justify the expulsion of the Jews from England in 1290, only a decade before the map was made. But for all the wonders of the map's imagery, a lot can be learned from what was left out of the map. Bar the Exodus scene's potential allusions to 13th century Judaism, there are few, if any, depictions of contemporary Muslims or Jews. Were they simply considered unimportant by the map's clerical creators? Or does this relate to a bigger message regarding the place of alternative religions in the inhabited world? The absence of contemporary Muslims or Jews on the Hereford world map is starkly demonstrated in Sicily. Indeed, for a region that witnessed multi-religious interaction on both a macro and micro regional level, it is interesting that the expulsion of Muslims from Sicily is not graphically depicted or even mentioned. Indeed, Sicily encompassed a multitude of religious identities, including Muslims, Byzantine Greeks and Jews which at times led to mixed religious families, and yet at other times led to popular conflict escalated by court politics. Interestingly, the practice of multilingualism allowed people to interact with multiple spheres of life, with both gender and religious fluidity epitomized in Sicily's eunuchs. For a region linked to England through previous Norman rule, 12th and 13th century Sicily is a fascinating case study in religious identity. And yet contemporary Muslims and Jews are still curiously absent on the Hereford map's iconography. In line with medieval cartography, the Hereford map uses both imagery and proximity to display medieval attitudes towards both peoples and places. In contrast to contemporary written sources, visual sources such as the map provide a significant alternative lens to view the world around 1300. I think um, visual sources can really help bring the Middle Ages to life for like the general public. Um, and we obviously have this kind of unhelpfully negative terminology like the dark ages. So it's maybe helpful in kind of counteracting that um, in some ways. Um, and I think visual sources also make us think more about the audience for the source. I mean, the audience for the source is still important when we're thinking about um, textual evidence as well, but I think it's more striking um, for visual sources. Um, you know, it's more obvious that they're kind of made to be seen and um, enjoyed and um, potentially maybe have a larger audience than some of the textual sources as well. Um, and I think that things like sort of status and display um, functions definitely kind of come across more strongly um, in visual material evidence. I think, again, we need to think more deeply about the nature of the evidence that we're looking at. And I think yes it's possible 
that the maker of the Hereford World Map had ideas about race and that the map maker had ideas about climate and so on. But I also think another way to look at it is to say that the map maker is just drawing what is on a map. Like when you look at a map, what kinds of things do you have to put on a map? And I think perhaps the map maker has looked at other maps or they've read descriptions of other maps and they're simply putting on the Hereford map what you would expect to find on a map. So is that map maker conscious of that decision making process and what it means? I'm not going to say they're an idiot and they just copied whatever they found. But I would also say another way of looking at it is to show that their ideas are influenced by what they found in their sources, whether or not they're aware of it, whether or not they're conscious of what they're actually doing. So two ways to look at it, I think. They copy what they find, but also their ideas are influenced by what they find. And it's up to us to decide whether we think the map maker is conscious of that or unconscious of that process. This video has engaged with cutting edge academic thought on the depiction of religion and monstrosity on the Hereford Map of Mundy and its links with both embodied and bodily representations of race. Yet it is also important to consider what role academics have in modern racial debates. Oh, well, we're not afraid of getting uh, involved into uh, these kind of debates are really important. We want to engage with things like that. Obviously not speaking for the whole of Hereford Cathedral, but really from my own perspective here. Um, but for we'll give you one example, we're, we're planning an exhibition next summer, which will be shown within Mapper Mundi and Shane Library exhibition. So I don't know if you know that at Hereford, we have the Mapper Mundi and the Chain Library side by side in a purpose built building so visitors can come and see both of them. But also within that space, we have room to show other things from our collections and we tend to have a changing series of usually three exhibitions a year in there. So we're planning one for next summer, which is on a, on a related topic really, we're calling it Strangers. And it's all about the idea of our difference and how you know, over the centuries, not a lot of last has changed. We've always kind of identified people for, uh, different from ourselves as others, misrepresented and distorted um, them all, almost, well, willfully, really, um, and sometimes in highly unpleasant ways. And you can see this um, starting with the Babylonian uh, world map. Um, which you know people are placing themselves at the center of everything and we've got lots of examples of that obviously the map of Mundi has Jerusalem at the center for a very good reason um, but still the the more unusual things are pushed out to the sides um, and, and we want to hang around that exhibition we want people to really think about this we're obviously going to use the strange races on the map as a, a key example and then build in other examples we're going to talk about Colonial, colonialism and uh, and kind of modern racism, the assumptions we make about people and question things like that. We hope to have a few talks around that topic as well. So I think there's there's much there's much in the map to engage with and to reflect on modern concerns and, and things that are highly political at the moment actually. We just have to excavate the language in the framework that they're operating in, because that's what's interesting, is not just to glom our perspective back onto the past as if everything is the same, but to, to see the subtleties, the differences, the trajectories, the possibilities, um, and, and that, you know, you, takes, training and, and patience to excavate that in the, in the language of the past.